Occupational English Test. Listening Test. This test has three parts. In each part you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a physiotherapist talking to Linda, a woman who has lower back pain. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hi there, Linda. My name is Sia, and I am one of the physiotherapists here. Hi Sia. How could I help you today? I've been getting a pain in my lower back, on the left side, around my hip and through the bum cheek area, when I'm running especially. Okay, how long has this been going on for? It's something I've had on and off for years. And, it started off as just a, a kind of dull pain and now it's, it really feels like it's spasming or something, it hurts even when I put weight on my left leg. Usually I, I feel it start and if I kind of lie on a tennis ball and massage through the muscle, it goes away. But, lately it's just been getting worse, and I can feel it sort of tight through my whole hip area. And, I can also feel it kind of even when I'm sitting and and sleeping, or at at night when I'm trying to sleep, if I roll I feel a kind of, it's hard to explain, it's like a, shooting pain that travels down my leg. Okay, so the shooting pain, where does that go? It's, it starts in the same place, and it goes like down the back of my leg, kinda through the back of my knee, and sometimes down to my ankle area. The pain also aggravates while doing exercises. Okay. Are there particular exercises that do it? Mostly, while running and walking. I think walking is even worse, actually. Hmm, interesting. How long can you walk for before the pain starts? I don't know. I kinda don't notice it when I'm walking, it's when I'm when I stop and then start again, like, yeah. So, I guess if I walked for. I'm a middle school teacher for the past 10 years and I walk every day to work. For example, which is about 45 minutes each way, and then if I run a couple of times, and then I'll notice the pain when I'm walking towards the end of the week, and it gets worse with each step as I walk into work. Okay. Tell me more about what you are doing for sport and physical activity at the moment. I ride my bike probably four or five times a week, not very far, maybe just 15 minutes each time and I run probably 40 kilometers a week. So, other than the riding and these long runs, do you do any other forms of physical activity? Well normally, I usually swim a couple of times a week as well. But I haven't been lately because I've been really busy at work. Okay. And you said that you've had this for a few years. What initially brought it on? I don't know. I think, when I was younger I used to play soccer and I had an injury where I dislocated my hip, and, it was really painful, yeah, I couldn't move for like a few weeks and I had a lot of physiotherapy and I had a lot of lower back pain after that for maybe a couple of years. But then it went away, and I haven't really had any major problems since then. Hmm, and, other than this dislocated hip on the same side, have you had any other major problems with your left leg, or with your back, or your hip or anything before? Oh, no, nothing really. How? I know that this has been going on for quite a number of years, but, how long has this been a problem where you've sort of felt you need to do something about it? I've been to an osteotherapist a couple of times about it in the past, just when it gets to this acute stage. So, this time it's only been like a few days that it's been really painful. Um hum, okay, no worries. And what sorts of things did the osteo do for you in the past? 
it was mostly putting pressure through that area, like massage and then, think she used to just like poke her elbow into my left hip and hold weight there for ages until the spasming stopped. Okay, no worries. How did you find the effectiveness of that? It relieved it. So, basically what normally happens is it's still quite sore for a couple of days after I have treatment, but it doesn't feel so tight. And I usually have to rest off it. Yeah, for at least a few days, and then it's gone. Or maybe it's still there a little bit but it's not like, doesn't get aggravated, and then it just drifts away. Has your osteo given you any exercises in the past for this problem? I do like a stretch where I kneel down and stretch through my front like hip flex area and another one where I cross my leg, kind of on an angle like that, across my knee, and stretch through there and I can feel that through my bum cheeks. Oh, good. Have you found anything else that helps the pain go away? Not really. I mean, if it feels really bad I can take maybe a Nurofen or something and it makes it better, feel a bit better, but, no other sort of exercise or stretching. Extract 2. Questions, 13 to 24. You hear a general practitioner talking to a patient called Xavier Murphy. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Xavier, come on in, and take a seat. My name is Anna Malcolm. Oh, hello doctor. Well, can you tell me what's brought you here today? Well, to be honest, I haven't been feeling well for the past week or so. That's no good. What sort of symptoms have you had? I have had a fever for a few days and I have been feeling a little bit nauseous. It comes on worse in the afternoons as well. Okay, and with the nausea, has sort of ended up with vomiting? Yeah, I did vomit actually, both yesterday morning and this morning. That's one of the reasons, I thought I'd better come and see you. And, are you taking anything for that? Things like Panadol? No, I haven't. I've just been trying to tough it out. Okay, and, what about your eating habits? Have you noticed any change to your appetite? Yeah, well, I don't seem to be as hungry, I haven't been able to complete my meals, without feeling a bit sick. Right. And, what about any other aches, or pains generally? I am feeling a little bit tired. And, I've had pain in my joints. I've been a little bit stiff in the mornings. Okay. Have you noticed any other sort of changes, such as yellowish skin or in the whites of your eyes? Well, I didn't, but my wife commented this morning that, she thought my skin had turned a bit yellowish. Right. What about the color of your urine? Any changes there? Now you mention it. I do think it's become darker in color. Now, Xavier, I would just like to get some background details before we go any further. Are you married? Yes I am. I've got two children, my son is 7 and daughter is 10. Oh, lovely. And, what about your employment, what sort of work do you do? I'm an electrician, by trade. I work on building sites, and the company I'm currently work for now, has quite a few overseas projects. So, I do go overseas quite a bit with my work. Okay. And, whereabouts have you worked recently? Well, this year, I've been to Dubai. And, I've just came from there about 10 days ago. I see. And, just tell me a little more about your general health. Pretty fine, I think. I eat healthily. I haven't had any complaints. And, do you smoke at all? Ah, uh, yes. I do smoke. But, I'm trying to keep it under control. But, suppose I smoke about 10 cigarettes a day. Um, and, what about alcohol? I have a couple of beers, most days. My wife and I are trying to be responsible. And, have a couple of alcohol-free days each week. That's an excellent idea. That's, very good, and now. Just to go on to your family history, what about your parents? Are they in good health? Yes they're both in quite good health, my father he retired a couple of years ago. But, he's fine. And, my mother. She's well, she does have high blood pressure. And, she does take medication for that I believe. 
I see, and, do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got three sisters, and, they're all well. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now look at question 25. You hear a monologue of a doctor briefing about rubella disease. Now read the question. Rubella is a contagious disease caused by a virus, which is also known as German measles. However, the disease is caused by a different virus than measles. With MMR vaccine, rubella disease can be prevented. This vaccine protects against three diseases, mumps, rubella, and measles. Rubella was a common disease in the U.S. before the invention of vaccines. The last major epidemic occurred between 1964 to 1965 when there was an estimated 12.5 million rubella cases in the country. However, rubella was completely eradicated due to successful vaccination programs in the country since 2004. Question 26. You hear a discussion about different types of kidney cancers. Now read the question. Like any other cancer, kidney cancer starts when the normal cells in one or both kidneys mutate and grow aggressively, forming a tumor or mass which can be benign or malignant. Kidney cancers that have originated elsewhere and metastasized to the kidney are clear cell adenocarcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma from the bladder, renal lymphoma, inverted papilloma carcinosarcoma, teratoma, and carcinoid tumor of the renal pelvis. Renal cell carcinoma is the most common type of kidney cancer that accounts for 80 to 85% of all cases. This develops within the microscopic filtering systems of the kidney, which are the tiny tubes that carry the urine to formation. Transitional cell carcinoma, also known as urothelial carcinoma, usually begins in the area where urine collects before moving to the bladder. Pathologically, this cancer is similar to bladder cancer and is treated like bladder cancer. Kidney sarcoma is a rare form of kidney cancer that is usually treated with surgery and chemotherapy. Sarcomas may be large and usually does not spread. Wilms tumor is a common type of kidney cancer that occurs among children and is treated differently than kidney cancers in adults. Common treatments for Wilms tumors are radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Squamous cell carcinoma, juxtoglomerular cell tumor, or Raynanoma, Bellini duct carcinoma, mesoblastic nephroma, mixed epithelial stromal tumors, or other types of kidney cancers. Question 27. You hear a nurse briefing her colleague about a patient. Now read the question. Michael Juarez. He's a 64-year-old here with onset AFib a history of type 2 diabetes and a stage 2 wound on his left sacrum. He's allergic to penicillin. 
He's married and lives at home with his wife, who has Alzheimer's. Okay. He's alert and oriented times two, and he's unable to ambulate independently. OT worked with him yesterday. He responds verbally. We're actively titrating his amiodarone drip. His lungs are clear. His blood sugar was high before breakfast, and he got seven units of insulin. His last bowel movement was two days ago. Uh, he's retaining urine due to BPH. Uh, he's on a cardiac diet and is due for a stress test at 10. Did you get all that? Wow, this is a heavy load. I better get started. There's a new admit coming from the ED. It's your turn to take it. He's come into room 346, and the nurse will be calling with report. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Question 28. You hear a discussion about common types of neuropathic pain. Now read the question. While there are countless types of neuropathic pain, some of the prominent types include carpal tunnel syndrome, is caused by nerve compression in the wrists and causes pain in the wrist, thumb and fingers. Central pain syndrome can occur after nervous system damage, such as a stroke. Degenerative disc disease one may feel neuropathic back pain if it causes damage to the nerves entering or exiting the spine. Diabetic neuropathy causes stabbing pain in the hands and feet of some diabetic patients. Phantom limb pain can occur in some patients after a limb is amputated. Postlepetic neuralgia is brought on by an outbreak of shingles and persists after the condition has cleared. Pudendal neuralgia is a type of pelvic pain caused by compression of the pudendal nerve. Sciatica is caused by compression or irritation of the sciatic nerve and often results in shooting pain that radiates down the back of the leg. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by shooting neck and facial pain. Question 29. You hear two doctors discussing about a new device to ease breathing difficulties in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Doctor, what about the new device that will ease breathing difficulty in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Decreasing the volume of lungs affected by emphysema or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease actually makes patients with the condition breathe more easily. If they take a breath due to the lung capacity, it causes shortness of breath. When we take a deep breath in, if it is hard to breathe up there, this is called shortness of breath which our patients often experience. Therefore, reducing the lung volume significantly improves the quality of life. The new device resembling a valve is used for achieving this, and this is being tested in the US. Question 30. You hear members of a hospital committee discussing problems in the X-ray department. Now read the question. So next on the agenda is the problems in the x-ray department. Nick, would you like to fill us in here? Well, as you all know, this is a very busy department. Uh, so we have four x-ray machines in all, including one in the fracture and orthopedic clinic area. But recently, one of the other x-ray machines developed a fault. And so we had to apply for authorization for the purchase of a new tube for it. There's been some kind of holdup with the paperwork, and while we've been waiting, patients are being brought into the fracture and orthopedic area for x-rays there instead, and of course that's causing further congestion.
That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the monologue of a physician, giving a lecture on the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. The two main categories of lymphoma are Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is a large group of diseases with different symptoms, treatments, and outcomes. The appropriate name of the type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma may include a number of descriptive terms that can be difficult to understand. Lymphomas arise from lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell, which are of two types, T cells and B cells. Both help in killing infectious agents, however, in slightly different ways. Based on the type of lymphocyte turned into the cancer cell, the patients may have a T-cell or a B-cell lymphoma. B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the more common type. There are many different types of B-cell and T-cell lymphomas, each behaving in a different way. Pathologists performing biopsy of the tumor define the cancers in terms of grade. High-grade lymphoma cells look quite different from normal cells. They tend to grow aggressively. Low-grade lymphomas have cells that look much more similar to normal cells and multiply gradually. Intermediate-grade lymphomas fall somewhere in the middle. The behavior of these types is also described as indolent and aggressive. What the pathologist describes as a high-grade or intermediate-grade lymphoma usually grows fast in the body, so these two types are considered aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Surprisingly, aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma often responds better to treatment, and many people with aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma are cured if they are diagnosed early. The most common kind of aggressive lymphoma is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. On the other hand, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma grows gradually, and these lymphomas are therefore called indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This group of non-Hodgkin lymphoma doesn't give rise to too many symptoms, but they are also long-standing and are less likely to be cured. The most common kind of indolent lymphoma is follicular lymphoma. At times, indolent lymphomas can transform into more aggressive. The majority of lymphomas are nodal lymphomas. That means they originate in the lymph nodes. However, it is possible for lymphomas to arise from anywhere else. When the lymphoma is mainly present in nodes, it is called nodal disease. Occasionally, most of the lymphoma may be in an organ that is not a part of the lymph system, such as the skin, the stomach, or the brain. In such condition, the lymphoma is referred to as extranodal. Therefore, nodal and extranodal refer to the primary site of the disease. A lymphoma can develop in a lymph node, and then involve other parts at a later stage. However, in such a case, it is still considered a nodal lymphoma, but is said to have extranodal involvement. In follicular lymphoma, the cancer cells arrange themselves in spherical clusters called follicles. In diffuse non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the cells are spread around without any clustering. Most of the time, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks follicular, and intermediate or high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks diffuse in biopsy. Non-Hodgkin lymphomas are also described as common or rarer, based on the statistics of the new cases every year. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a physiotherapist called Chris Maloney giving a presentation about treating a high jumper with a knee injury. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hello, I'm Chris Maloney, a physiotherapist specialising in sports injuries, and I'd like to present a case study to give you an idea of the sort of work I do. It features a very successful high jumper in her mid-twenties who was referred to me with severe pain in her right knee, and that's the leg she takes off from when she jumps. What's more, when she stepped up her training in preparation for a big competition, the pain worsened and she'd been forced to pull out of the event. After that, she'd taken several months off training to rest and get treatment from various therapists. To her dismay, however, not only did the pain continue, it actually got worse, meaning she was unable to do any strength training, let alone jump-specific work. Uh, by the time I saw her, she was on the verge of giving up, having lost virtually all belief in her ability. My initial assessment quickly confirmed patellar tendinitis in the affected knee, accompanied by some swelling and significant tenderness over the lower part of the kneecap. This wasn't difficult to diagnose. Uh, I also noted that she was slightly overweight for her height and had rather flat feet, but that's not so unusual in high jumpers. A further assessment revealed that the gluteal muscles connecting the hips and thighs were considerably less sturdy than you'd expect in an athlete of this calibre, and both the lateral retinaculum connecting the patella to the femur and the iliotibial band, the ligament running down the outside of the thigh, were tight and tender. As a first stage, I was keen to show I could help by relieving some of the pain, so I worked at loosening her lateral retinaculum to see how much of the tendon pain was due to inflammation and how much came from restriction of normal patella movement. This manipulation and massage instantly cleared the pain she'd felt while doing a single leg dip exercise, where you stand on one leg and bend the knee. This indicated that her tendon pain was most likely due to patellofemoral joint dysfunction caused by muscle imbalance and poor biomechanics and not by an active inflammatory process or partial tear in her patella tendon. So an MRI scan wasn't needed. The treatment continued along similar lines for some weeks uh, with loosening of the lateral retinaculum and deep tissue massage of the iliotibial band and other muscles. One option at this point was something called taping. This is a way of reducing pain so that athletes can continue with strength exercises. But it seemed clear from early on that we shouldn't put taping on this patient's patella and tendon until she started jumping again. She was getting pain relief and progress simply from the manual techniques and taping might have led to problems later on. Athletes often become dependent on tape and, and other accessories. Um, in other words, instead of aiming for 100% muscle strength and joint position control, they settle for 80% plus artificial support. The patient also had a specially designed program of gym activities. Although she needed to restore power to those muscles affected by inflammation and tenderness, uh, the priority was to get her posture and alignment right. Uh, she started by doing double leg squats with her back to a wall in front of a mirror so that she could see whether her feet were arched and if her knees were over her feet. Uh, she also did squats while squeezing a ball between her knees. There was light leg press work followed by single leg stance work, first static, then on wobble boards, and with elastic resistance. She progressed to moving on and off steps, sometimes holding weights, all the time paying close attention to positioning and muscle and joint alignment. The next stage was to liaise with the patient's coach. She began running, uh, jogging for stamina, and then sprint sessions. Work on power was stepped up gradually and included some weightlifting. After some analysis, we also decided to modify her uh, her run-up to the high jump bar by beginning from a wider position and running in with much less of a curve. There was much less of an impact on the ankle, knees, and hip, especially in her right jumping leg. Interestingly, 
The patient reported that remodelling the run-up felt fresh and motivating and helped to reinforce the sense she had of being a reborn athlete. Once the rehabilitation process was complete, she was able to compete without pain and free of any reliance on taping or knee strapping. So, uh, before I go on... That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.